transfer refers to the particle arrangement um, within a soil sample. So in soil structure is really important when it comes to um, the integrity of the soil because it's going to actually th determine the rate at which um, water can um, enter the soil. So um, if you think about major rain events like uh, downpours or floods that we see throughout the Midwest and the Southwest, um, a lot of that water actually hits the ground, is not absorbed, and goes straight into arroyos or river systems, and that's where we get massive flooding happening sometimes. Um, so we really want um, soils on rangeland to have good um, water infiltration rates, so the ability for them to accept water at um, a pretty moderate pace. So soil structure can be split up into six major uh, classifications, starting with single grain and going clear down to a massive um, structure. So uh, single grain is where we have individual particles that are very, very small and allow um, very rapid infiltration of water. A blocky structure is where the particles get a lot bigger um, and they, uh, they tend to uh, create more total space um, within a soil sample, but the infiltration rate is really moderate because water is actually having to find its way in between these bigger particles for infiltration to happen. And then um, the slow plate-like soil structure is where we see actually sheets of soil happening, and this happens a lot with our clay soils. On the bottom of this figure, we can see um, very uh, similar uh, rapid, moderate, and slow infiltration rates depending on whether we have a granular structure, a prismatic structure, or a massive structure. So uh, granular structure is where we see particle sizes that are a lot bigger than single grain, um, whereas prismatic is where we have uh, structures in that make up the soil that are actually going to be in a vertical position rather than a horizontal or a, a random um, orientation. And then a massive structure, we get very, very slow infiltration because it's an extremity of the plate-like uh, configuration where we have just layers of soil that have very little space in between the particles and are really forming huge blocks um, and have very slow infiltration rates. So soil depth is um, going to be the third component that we're going to look at and really this refers to the distance from the soil surface to the bedrock and this becomes important for rooting materials of our plants on rangeland. So um, the productivity of a plant is directly related uh, sorry um, is going to be directly related to its ability to penetrate different horizons of the soil. And um, it's also, um, its productivity is also going to be affected by how much moisture the soil has the ability to hold. pH of the soil, I'm sure you guys have all done a soil pH test at some point during your education, and this really indicates um, the exchangeable ion capacity of the soil and that becomes very important for a number of reasons but um, if as we get into different soil types across the US um, specifically our our salted soil types that's gonna lend itself to be a more basic uh, pH so a higher pH and that's gonna really affect the type of plants that can grow in that type of soil so again, just as a review, pH ranges from 1 to 14 and is an expression of uh, basic or acidic soils. So basic soils are a uh, pH of 10 or more, and acidic soils are a pH of 4 or less. Organic matter is a really uh, large indicator of fertility. So um, organic matter is going to consist of decayed plant material and animal residues so we can actually build up organic matter with grazing animals because they will be um, consuming vegetation and then defecating which is going to um, like we talked about in the biomass lecture is actually going to put organic matter back into the soil 
Um, soil organic matter is not going to be a large percentage of the total soil present in a profile, but it's, um, it is going to be roughly between 4 to 6 percent, depending on what type of rangeland you're talking about. So very poor degrade, degraded rangeland tends to have 3% uh, and less soil organic matter, and healthy rangeland tends to have 4-6% uh, uh, to 6 of organic matter. We're going to actually see soil organic matter in the upper 30 centimeters of the soil, so usually within the A horizon. And... Um, this is going to be very, very important because the organic matter really enables the soil's ability to hold water and nutrients, um, and it's also going to provide a source of nutrients for the plants to help with their cofactors in making all the process of photosynthesis take place. Um, and finally, soil organic matter is going to hold uh, mineral particles together so we don't get a lot of runoff and topsoil degradation um, if we have high levels of soil organic matter and we get hit with a massive precipitation event. Soil fertility is um, referring to mineral status, so the biodiversity of the minerals and the amount of the minerals in the soil. And this is a really um, important part, but secondly, um, in controlling plant productivity. So soil fertility is hard to manage in rangeland because unlike cropping systems, we really don't have the ability to, um, to apply ma masses or uh, to apply different amounts or additional sources of nutrients like we do in fertilization systems. So keep in mind that when it comes to soil fertility, the most limiting elements on rangeland are going to be nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So the same things that we are supplementing for in most of our row crop situations. Um, and these are also going to be uh, common uh, soil additions. Um, in greenhouse situations as well. So we tend to formulate fertilizers off of NPK ratios. So the major soil orders of the U.S. Um, are shown here in this slide. There's also um, a really good description of each one of these in your text as well. So the soil classification system that you see here is actually used by NRCS and within the Department of Ag, and it is called the Comprehensive Soil Survey System. And the major features of this system are that um, it's based on the different characteristics of the soil as they are actually found in the field. So the soil names um, are going to give the major physical characteristics, um, such as order, suborder, great group, subgroup, family, and series. Um, so we're not going to go through how to classify uh, soils. I'm going to save that for Dr. Lyle's class. But just realize that our younger soils um, that are really lacking a lot of hor horizon development are going to be these into soils. Um, and then some of the um, high organic matter soils that we see uh, in cropping systems are going to be down um, here towards the bottom, so eutosoils as well as histosoils. Unfortunately, the ones that we see the most on rangelands are going to be poorer quality soils. So a mollusol is going to be um, a soil type in a natural grassland or in on the prairie. So we see a lot of mollusols through the Midwest um, on the prairie system and they are very deep usually and have um, a high organic matter content as well as a high base supply um, of nutrients as well and their profile um, tends to look very um, large with the A horizon, a very small B horizon and then a fairly small C horizon as well. Our um, arid soils or arid soils are going to be soils that we find in the desert. So um, that's why you see a cactus there. Um, so these soils are found throughout the southwest. And um, their profile development is going to be, sorry, um, a very, very tiny A horizon, but a very large B horizon followed by C. 
Um, and so these soils tend to be dry more than six months out of the year. So the arid soils have really developed to um, uh, not actually have any precipitation hit them with um, for more than half the year. And then finally, our alpha soils are similar to mollusols, um, but they're leached with more subsurface clay accumulation. Um, so again, our A horizon is going to be uh, fairly fairly small, have a pretty large E um, horizon, and then a B horizon as well. And so these soils are going to be associated with the eastern deciduous forest and grass savanna in California and um, its vegetation type. So these are a lot of the soils that we'll see in our oak woodlands as well as in some of our he more heavily forested areas. So here's just a... Um, uh, figure of the different soil types that you see across the U.S. Again, you can see um, throughout the Midwest is really heavy green, so that's going to be a lot of the mollusols, um, and they're contiguous, which um, we don't have very much experience with in California. We have a lot of different soil types, so you can actually travel from San Luis Obispo across to Bishop and cross eight different soil types, where as um, if you're going across Kansas, you can drive from one end of the state to the other and not see another um, soil type. So California is very unique in that we have um, major pockets of different soil types. And if we look on a more of a global basis, we can see that um, through Eastern Europe and northern um, the Northern Asian continents, we see a lot of alpha soils um, down in our desert or not, not our desert regions, but our rainforest regions, you can see a lot of oxa soils. Um, these are pretty fertile, so this is going to be rainforested area. They get a lot of precipitation. A lot of things grow there, therefore a lot of things um, are returned to the soil in terms of um, organic matter. So when it comes to managing principles um, and precipitation levels, remember that um, in terms of precipitation, we need to manage how much forage we're actually taking. Um, so that's uh, in dates and out dates for our grazing animals. The time that we graze those uh, pastures and the frequency, so how often we come back to those pastures, um, whether it's once a year, twice a year, or six times a year. However, in terms of the soil amount um, or the soil type, we need to make sure that we maintain enough vegetative cover to protect the soil profile. So the concept of taking um, everything or 100% of the forage um, gets very detrimental. And our ancestors in the late 1800s, early 1900s didn't have any experience with that. And we're still reaping some of those ramifications today. So that ends our soil lecture, um, and hopefully you guys have a better idea of how they play into rangeland management.